Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, like the long train of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, and praying, mm. excuse me, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. It goes on to say, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Sunday, and from there they sailed to Tricus. So when they arrived at Salus, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elmas, the magician, so that is the meaning of his name, posed them. Same guy, Bar Jesus, posed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also filled with the Holy Spirit from the uh, from the faith. But Saul, who was, I'm sorry, but Saul, who was also called Paul, found the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths? Have hold. The hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Thank you. Be seated. Father, please bless the reading and teaching of your word this morning. May it touch the hearts of your people, and may they learn everything that you would have them to learn this morning. And apply it to their life. That's our prayer. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good to see y'all. Joy and I miss y'all so much. We sure did. Come on in, ladies of the choir. It's great to see y'all this morning. We have some must visitors this morning. Please. Those of y'all who don't know our brother Jason and his lovely wife Kelly grew up in this church and they're young and say, Corbin, they're visiting. And uh, Jason, for those of y'all who don't know, is the naval angel. And I only mention that because it's a big deal. The only other navi uh, aviators in the world that are better than naval aviators are marine aviators. Tyson <laughs> 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 said was the chief that, and I understand that. <laughs> Got a great thing. That's Jason. He's a good guy. I'm getting around. It's great to see y'all this morning, Jason. It sure is. One of the blessings, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, is knowing y'all when we were all young or very early in our lives and, and growing old with y'all, seeing the children being born and grow up and how blessed we are. And uh, I look around and I see some of y'all, it's just it's such a blessing that God lets us enjoy each other in that way. Growing old, I guess. Well, here we have Acts 13. And Acts 13 is about the church at Antioch. And some people talk about Antioch as being the model church, but there's a lot of good stuff going on there. Daniel, it's good to see you too this morning, brother. Thank you. A lot of good stuff was going on there. You see immediately what they're doing. They're praying. They're worshiping God. They're fasting. They're doing the things that cause the Holy Spirit to move in their church. And ultimately what happens is the Holy Spirit gives them direction. They learn from their devout worship what God wants them to do. There was no planning. There were no committees that said, okay, what are we going to do for the next 20 years? Now, I'm not bad mouthing those things. I'm just saying, when you depend on God, what does the scripture tell us over and over? He, he's going to direct your steps. Man makes his plans, and the scripture says God laughs. Not to say we shouldn't plan, but that we should be sure that we're in, when we're in step with God, when he is centered in our life, he's going to have an impact. He's going to direct us and guide us, and that's a good thing, because as I love to say, he can see around curves where we cannot see. Now, they sent them out, Paul and Barnabas, to do a good work, and that's exactly what happened. But what ultimately we see in this particular scripture today is when they were sent out, they were 
They, they met with uh, stiff, stiff opposition, rejections in some cases. And that happened inevitably when you're talking about Jesus Christ. Today, we know that we meet those, those kind of same problems. Do you have the slides for me, Cynthia? Yes, sir. Now, just to give you an idea, I watched Hank as he taught his lesson last week, and he did the slides, and I was shamed that I didn't apply. <laughs> so here you got slides this morning. I do mine a little bit different, though. So I'll show y'all the region where they were and uh, give you an idea. It always helps me if I can graphically depict something as well as hear about it. I get a better feel for it. So this area of northern Africa, Egypt, over here into the desert of um, Palestine, what they call the Negev, y'all know that region, some of y'all have been there, up until to Israel and to uh, Phoenicia or modern-day Lebanon and to Syria, we find Antioch. Now, Antioch is about 300 miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem down here in Israel, the southern part of modern-day Israel, uh, all the way up to Antioch, that's 300 miles, approximately, just to give you an idea of the scale. Now, there in Antioch, here next to Seleucia. Seleucia, if you regulate, you know, is about 15 miles to the west on the coast of the Mediterranean. So it's a day's walk, or uh, even shorter on a camel. If you got a camel, you can hop on for a donkey. Now, Seleucia from Tarsus, where Paul is from, up here in southern modern day Turkey, at that time, uh, Cilicia, is about 90 miles if you go by water. And of course, that's the way most folks went during that time. Now, we read the scripture today that we from Antioch to Cyprus. Cyprus is approximately 110 miles if you go due southwest. Now, we know from Rick telling us that if we get there on the boat or we try to get there on the boat, we're going to drift a bit. So it might be a little bit further than 110 miles. Rick, I couldn't resist. I saw you back there and I had to pick on you a little bit. Further. Oh, good to see y'all. I'm on the key. So anyway, they went on the uh, east of Cyprus, all the way over to Kapos, which at that time was the cap. That was about a hundred mile trip from one end of Cyprus to the other. Cyprus is a relatively small island in comparison to, say, Florida. If you superimpose Cyprus over the state of Florida, Cyprus only takes up several counties in central Florida as far as area. It's relatively small when you compare it. Next slide, please, ma'am. Is that too much information for you? No, great. Anyway, that's closer up. And you get a better picture of what's in that region. Higher, excited, and of course, Antioch and Seleucia up there, and then the Cyprus out there, 100 miles to the west. That is today, that's an overhead of Salamis. Now, I put this up there so y'all can get an idea of what. The population must have been during this time. Now, I searched for figures, but of course, they didn't keep up that too much back then. But you see a large amphitheater that, when it was complete back in that day in the first century, would have held about 50,000 people. And they had baths and they had a gymnasium and they had public toilets. There were actually 44 public toilets that they had. And I guess that's an indication to um, archaeologists about the population, and it means that there was a significant population because they had that many outdoor toilets. I find that kind of interesting, but I'm not sure if that's appropriate for a phone school. So <laughs> they were open too, if you can believe that, even back in that time, which is also interesting, but I'll go on. So that's Salamis, famous for the worship of Zeus. Of course, this was a Roman. Um, part of the Roman Empire, uh, Roman government, our proconsul, for his policy we read about, was the governor. Now, next slide, please, ma'am. Go all the way to the west, and this is a modern day photo in this region of Paphos, the capital. There were actually two Paphos. There was an old Paphos, which would have been here on the coast, and then a new Paphos, which I understand is about 10 miles away. Um, this was significant and known for the worship of Aphrodite. They say that Aphrodite formed the foam of the sea in this region. Too much information, but that was a big tradition because 
that particular goddess was a big deal in the Roman Empire writ large. Do I have another one? I think I'm no, done. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate those. So anyway, that'll give you an idea of the geography on what we're looking at. Now, the Holy Spirit, the lesson I want you to take away, works in us, calling us to kingdom work. And we see that as we read what's going on in the church at Antioch. Scripture says in Philippians 4, as you know, I can do all things through Christ. It strengthens me. The Spirit works in us. The Spirit works in us. Is he working in you this morning? If he is not, you know the reason why? You feel like sometimes that you're kind of hanging out there? Because we're not letting Mike, you feel sometimes like you're kind of hanging out. You probably don't because you're all spiritual and everything. Oh, but it's, 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 yeah, I do. Some of us kind of hanging out there some days, are we? I know you know that because you were a preacher. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, what we can do is lean on the Holy Spirit. And if we do that more and more, God, I'm going to go on down until I only have a little bit of time. Okay. Um, our Lord suffered to accomplish our salvation. In doing so, he has provided us with an example of how we are to respond to him. Here's what it says in 1 Peter 2, when he reviled, what Jesus did. When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. He did not revile in turn. What happens to you when some, someone uh, says negative and nasty things about you? When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I had a conversation with somebody I love this week. And in their life, there's someone who's given them a real hard time, has lied about them, misrepresented them multiple times in significant setting. And it is a hard thing for that particular person to get beyond that. They're a Christian. But having that happen to them is a hard, hard thing. If the Holy Spirit is not ruling in our life, it will be an even harder thing to get beyond when you have contention with your brothers and sisters. And I want to tell you, as you well know, you're going to have contention with your brothers and your sisters. So what do you do? What's your first reaction to that contention? What is the process that you go through in your heart, in your life? If you're not relying on the Holy Spirit, you're going to fall down. And you're going to be hanging out there like Mike was talking about. And the final point they want you to get, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the kingdom work. He calls us to do it, they tell us in the Sunday school lesson. Listen, here's what I know, just looking at this scripture today. They went out and immediately they got a false prophet contending against them. But God had sent them. Scripture says the Holy Spirit sent them. So what do we know from the scripture about doing God's work? Now you answer, Daniel, go ahead, tell me. Well, a couple of things that you've been very interesting with the passage. You know, Jesus, when he sent the disciples out, like in Matthew, he sent them out two by two. Here we have Paul and Barnabas, two by two. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and wherever two or more gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So you can see with Paul and Barnabas, Jesus is in the midst of them. All the, all the missionary, missionary work that they're about to do. They're also travel by ship. Well, what is it about a ship? A ship can be, you know, if it travels by sails, the sail, you can put up the sail, but it's God that causes the wind to blow. So they're at the mercy of where the wind's going to direct that ship. They may be able to navigate to some degree, but it's the currents of the ocean. It's the, it's the variables outside of their control that get to their destination. So that's kind of like leaning on God's spirit versus our own. Our, like God, a lot of times Paul said, I had planned to go here, but I ended up here. But God had a purpose from here, not here. So that's kind of how the Holy Spirit works. Ephesians 3 says this. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Goes on to say that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with life by his spirit in the inner man. There is nothing, as we've already read, I can do all things through Christ. There is nothing I cannot accomplish in Christ. If you are in God's mission, you're going to be good. You're going to be good up until that point God is done with you on that for that particular mission. He is going to take care of you. Your life is not done until God says it is. That's right. Until his purpose for you is complete, it's time for you to go on. Until then, you got no worries. Care what the what Satan, what circumstances throw at you, nothing can overwhelm you 
when you are uplifted by God's Holy Spirit. You are protected. Y'all going down to Cuba? Well, I tell you, Cuba just makes me real uncomfortable. But I know that God is going to protect you all. You got those slides? You put them up for me real quick. Mm -hmm. We're working on the lesson this week and studying. And of course, don't get sent out. But as well, as you read on in Scripture, Paul and Barnabas and others from other churches took gifts and helped and blessed the church at Jerusalem because of hard times that were going on, a worldwide uh, famine and that kind of thing. As we're studying, and I'm thinking about uh, Cynthia and them, they're going down to Cuba. They're giving a few. There's a, uh, a food distribution specifically for Cuba in Orlando. It's it's a place that this is a place that I used to order the food through, but it was in Miami. Now they have a new office in Orlando, and they're also doing shipping now. Yeah. So a lot is going on all over places, all over the world, but in particular with respect to what we see and what we do, just from uh, Cynthia as a representative of this class to the nation of Cuba. It's amazing what's going on and what and what is being done. And Cynthia, those folks are going down and knock over this one. Y'all know about it. And it did take four and a half hours in line to send this box. Is that because there's... Because it, it takes a long time to process. They have to go through each item, make sure it's approved to send it. Ah, yeah. And, you know, they got to do all the customs things. And so each person takes about 30 minutes yeah. to, to do. It's and like, there was a long line. Yeah. It's not an easy process. No. You know, the church will great stuff. Here's an example. Church and our specifically our class represent place. Mm -hmm. It would be great stuff. You're taking five people down with you on a gale going. God bless her. We need to show up right for them. <laughs> Seriously. Let us, us be the Gail been on missionary journeys before. She's been to Africa. She's gonna be all over the world here for long. We need to pray a circle of protection, a hedge of protection around them and some fruit. Not only with our prayers, but with our giving. So um that's my plug for Cynthia and those folks this morning. But it's important. It's what we see in scripture is being lived out in our church and even through our class. And that's a good thing. So I think you know y'all this morning and know what's going on. Y'all do good stuff. And it's a pleasure and a blessing to be a part of this church and this class. Y'all love our church. Amen. Yes. I'm gonna tell you, when um I was listening to a sermon this week, he was preaching exactly about Acts 13, this preacher out in California, and they got a great church. He said, I look at their in Antioch, and I can't help but compare it with our church here in California. And I know we think of California and we think it's all evil out there, but it's not. There are cells of good out there. And he said, he went on in his sermon, and he said, We have a good church in comparison. I'm very proud of our church. And as he was talking about this, I'm thinking about First Baptist Church, Leesburg. And I'm thinking the same thing. You know, I'm not here about else. I've got my little complaint here and there, but it's petty and does that mean anything? In the big uh, scheme of things, what I know is our church is a great church. What I know is God specifically put me in this church. I know that He specifically put y'all in this church. So if we find a little problem with it, we need to look at ourselves first. What I'm saying to you is that though Antioch is an example, it's a good example, we have a great church right here ourselves. If you're here, you should be tickled because it is a great church. Good things happen in our church. Now, the context of this week, we know that in chapter 11, Peter had explained to the church elders at Jerusalem what he had been doing as far as witnessing to the uh, uh, Gentiles. You know, from the, the last time I talked two weeks ago, we talked about that. We talked about Cornelius and how the or excuse me, the circumcised believers had a problem with that. But God does not show favoritism. So moving on quickly from that, we know that in chapter 12, we see that Peter was arrested. And then he was miraculously free. God was not done with Peter. James had been beheaded. But God said, no, not, not with Peter. This is not happening. So he sent an angel. And the angel took him out of prison, freed him from the chains, walked him by the guards, through the gates, out of the town, and freed him up. Most ama amazing miracle, what God did in front of everybody. He did what he did. He was not going to allow his mission for Peter to be thwarted. If you are on a mission for God, whatever God's purpose is in your life, the Lord will not allow it to be thwarted. We quit sometimes. 
Now, none of us are going to admit to that, but we do. We're tempted to twip, to quit lots more times, and we're not going to admit to that either. But we do because of the human condition, because life is hard, even on good days sometimes. Life is hard. What did Job say? Man's born to few days in trouble. It's true. But in the Holy Spirit, what Jesus said, I've overcome the world. You got that. The same thing in your life. You overcome the world. Now, the church is strengthened and grown, as we see in the book of Acts. We see the birth of it. We see all that God does in growing that church. And we pray for that same thing to be happening in our church. Now, when you look at the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters have to do primarily with the birth of the church, the growing of the church, and with the apostle Peter and all that he does. There's a little bit of other stuff, but mostly it's along that theme. And then from 12 on, it's mostly about Paul and his missionary journeys and the further growth of the church. Book of Acts, in my humble view, is one of those books we should read all because it's encouraging. And we see the Holy Spirit at work. And too many times we are filled in our lives with discouragement. Are we not? Yeah. Get us down. Book of Acts will lift you up if you read it on a regular basis. And I encourage you to do that along with the other scripture. And be sure not to neglect the Old Testament. Now, Saul and Barnabas were commissioned. As the church members, the leaders of the church, and there were five of them, scripture mentions, were praying, they were worshiping, and they were fasting. And we're going to talk a minute about that. Uh, the Holy Spirit acted and you see what happened it happened when they're worshiping while they are worshiping that's a significant thing you ever ask yourself the question sometimes in your life why is nothing going on you feel a dead space you feel like god's not speaking to you or you're not hearing from god you feel like you're kind of hanging out there as we already mentioned you feel that sometimes well the question you should ask yourself is how are you doing with worship? Are you praying? And I know I beat y'all up about this. So I'm sorry, but scripture keeps coming back to it. You can blame it on LifeWay because they keep bringing it up. Mm -hmm. But it's important when you think about it. How are you doing with praying? How are you doing with your worship? Is it genuine? You know, you don't just worship up here. You worship every day, every moment of your life in one way or another at a level a certain level or another, you are worshiping. Your relationship with God goes on. How close are you with God? Is every consideration, is he first in your life? Do you go to him when there's trouble or only when there is trouble? Do you go to him all the time? How close is your relationship with God? It's a rhetorical question, but I want to ask you again. How close is your relationship with God? This is significant what they're doing. Again, they weren't planning. No committees. And God moved. God moves. If you look throughout Scripture, there is a thing. There is a tra tra trajectory of the Lord's movement. And typically, you will find that when he does things in the church, that when he does things with his people, it is because his people are seeking him out. It is because his people are close to him. If you fail to be in that closeness, then that's when those there, there are those flat times. The trajectory that we see in the scripture is God moving when his people are close to him. It's significantly important. Now, as I said, it was a model church. Scripture for today's lesson. If we look at the first uh, few verses. Now in the church of Daniel, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, and it goes on. Barnabas and Saul, the Holy Spirit said, set them apart for the work that I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them all. When we look at what God requires of us, it is um, very oftentimes very, very specific. Mike, you pick on you again. I apologize for a little bit. You're just too easy. So I know you are a preacher. When you felt the call to ministry, what was 
the process that you went through. I know you had to go and 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 talk to a, a bunch of other preachers, professors, and they questioned your theology to make sure you were right. And I know that there was a time when though they laid their hands on you. Did they do that? Yes. What was the significance of that, Mike? Uh, they they were putting their their stamp approval on on the preparation that God had uh, enabled me to complete. Uh, you know my my training studying the Bible. Uh, when uh, when uh, when I thought about the fall of ministry, uh, some people some people point to it. A moment in time uh, when when they made a decision for Christ uh, to go into full time Christian service, and I had I had one of those moments. I was a couple of years old in the Lord, and there was this uh, traveling evangelist that came to our church, and believe it or not, he preached that night on UFOs. It was the craziest sermon I was going to be, and it was like, "What are you talking about? I've never heard heard this thing." And, and at the end of the sermon, he said, I just sense there's somebody here that God is calling into the ministry. And my invitation tonight is for anybody who feels called. And I shot up the aisle. I ran up the aisle uh, because God prepared my heart. But when I share with people about um, my call to ministry personally, I usually share three things that, that God had... <clears throat> placed within my heart uh, just an undeniable and an unquenchable desire to serve him. <laughs> Secondly, he had gifted me with certain gifts that are conducive for ministry. And then third, and I think this was the most important in my life, was he confirmed the first two in my life by godly men to whom I submitted. They examined my my life. They they looked at my time in ministry in, in, in my local church. And and I think we need to do more of that in terms of mentoring, you know, younger men yes. and um and actually seeing them grow uh, in their preparation. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's good. I appreciate all that. We'll get back to it. The laying on of hands. Yes. Yeah, so I would I want to keep particularly on that thing. It's not more important than what you said. What you said is most important. But the laying on of hands is significant for what reason, Mike? Uh, because because it's it's the authority of, of of those individuals putting their stamp of approval on you through the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God said, "Set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work that I called them to do," and they did that. Um, I think it's significant, Roy, that this is a local church sending missionary team. God started the first missionary effort with the local church. Amen. And sometimes I think we get uh, hung up with mission organizations and, and the, the work is too big and we can't do it as a local church. And I, I thank God that our church is not only a light to our community, but as Pastor Cliff says, it's a launching pad to the nations. And, and we take missions seriously. Amen. And if you look at the Church of Antioch and exactly the way it was done in the Church of Antioch, the Holy Spirit leading is exactly the way it's done in this church. It's not to say that this church doesn't support other mission organizations. It does. But how many times do people from the church here itself go out because the church here commissioned them to go out? And Cynthia and her group, one of those, one of those. So the Holy Spirit directly leads the church. That's a significant thing. That's what our church needs to be doing. When our church stops doing that, then that's problematic. But it actually stops doing that. That's a good thing. So the context, don't miss that this morning. This happening is their worship, prayer, and fasting, their reverence and awe of God Almighty. That's how it happened. God works when his people honor him. The fact that they are fasting may imply that they are earnestly seeking God's guidance. What is it about fasting anyway? And we've talked about it, but we're going to hit it again this morning. Fasting indicates a significant earnestness. It's, it, it indicates a willingness to give something up for God. Is God going to pay attention to it? Oh, yeah. Apparently. And he said, when you fast, not if. He said, when you fast. 
So he commands us to. I appreciate that, but I'm not going to go there. I get in trouble showing up. Sure. Sure. Okay. What I know is that he gets God's attention. And I and that and I'm going to try that again because I don't like the way that sounded. What I know is that God honored it. Okay. And, you know, fasting, if you're not doing it, it's something you might want to think about. If God leads you to do it, then you should do it. If he's not leading you to do it, don't do it. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. I think it gets flesh out of the way and gives you the spirit ruling instead of yourself is what fasting does. It, it controls, it takes command over the flesh so the spirit can lead you. I mean, that's a good one. Thank you for that. Uh, in Judaism, in Judaism and in Christianity, fasting sometimes accompanies a significant period of deep and sincere waiting on God. You know, we're all in a hurry when we pray much of the time. Some of us, not y'all, I'm sure. We're all in a hurry to pray and get God, get about doing what we're doing. Well, fasting enters you enter into that relationship with God at a deeper level, at another level, at a level that sets aside self and uh, honors God, raises up God. So fasting has a significant effect in a relationship with God. Now, remember, his heart was broken for the exiles. Uh, Jerusalem had fallen, 586, uh, 722 and 586. Northern Kingdom in 722 and 586, Southern Kingdom went to exile. Nehemiah, his heart was broken when he heard about what was going on after the exile in Jerusalem, how it broke it down. And he prayed. He went to the Lord. This is the, in part what he prayed. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. It goes on. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Well, you know from Nehemiah's prayer, Nehemiah and Ezra, they went back. God sent them back. He heard those prayers and they reestablished the city of Jerusalem. The nation of Israel. And look at Israel today. The world can be against Israel, and Israel is going to go on. Because it belongs to God. It is his holy city. And there are some people who dispute that, I know, but they have a right to be wrong. I don't care. <laughs> Just look at history. Just look at what scripture said. Forever I give this land to God. God says, I am faithful to you. God says, I keep my promises. He, he made that promise to the nation of Israel. In spite of their sin, in spite of your sin, you are saved if you believe the living faith in Jesus Christ. He keeps that promise to you. Y'all hear him? Yeah. Y'all Amen. Amen. It's a promise that God will never break it to Israel. Scripture, y'all remember the prophet is Anna, the Lord Jesus had been born, and uh, Joseph and Mary took him to the temple to uh, keep the law. And the prophet Anna was there. I think she was 82 or 84. Been there since she was lost her as a widow. Uh, praying and fasting, the scripture says, all her days. Never left the temple. This is what the scripture says. And then was a widow until she was 84. Talking about Anna. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day. What does it say? Fasting and praying. So I'm not telling y'all should fast. That's between you and God, but it's something you should think about what Scripture said. It's a model in Scripture. Now, James Christ goes on to say, draw near to God. What? Just what we need to be doing. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It's true. Yeah. I'm 70 years old, and I look back on my life, and I know it's true. When I draw near to God, he draws near to me. When I put up my hand, forget about it. Goes on to say, cleanse your hand, you sinner. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Are y'all double-minded? None of y'all are. I know you're not. It's that church over there. <laughs> None of us are double-minded. We should not be. Real quick, so I got to go. I only have a minute. Now, I'm just curious about the book of James. Because the book of James is written to the 12 tribes of Israel, which were, some of those may not have been converted yet because they may have unbelieved. But we, if we're new in Christ, hey, hey, you stop. The book of James is written to the church. There may have been an immediate audience of Hebrews. I don't question that. But ultimately, God's purpose was in the book of James and with all scriptures of the church. It's written to the church. Go ahead. But I guess what he was saying is like some of those people may not have been converted yet. Because if we're, if we're, if we're in Christ for new creations, we're saints. How can we still be sinners and saints? I mean, yes, we, we are saints that still sometimes sin, but our identity is in our being a saint. 
So, but I can see that he was talking to an audience there that wasn't converted yet, and they were kind of getting their feel for the gospel, and they were like, well, maybe the gospel's for me, maybe it's not for me, I'm kind of double-minded, maybe, maybe, and because they're trying to go back to Judaism and Christianity, they're trying to see, that, that that's how I see double-mindedness, is which way to go. Yeah, uh, and I don't dispute that. What would add to that, and uh, I'm out of time, I'm sorry, I'll let you go in just a second. What I would add to that is that even as Christians, Holy Spirit doesn't always reign in our life. Mm -hmm. We seem to have multiple thrones in our hearts. Sometimes Holy Spirit sits on the throne. Sometimes I sit on. I'm still a believer. I, I still belong to the Lord, but I continue in sin. Here's what I would say to you. Look at your life. you got a problem with this. Look at your life. What's the trajectory of your life? Really easy for me at 70 years old. I see the ups and downs of my life. I see when I've been closer to Christ, and I see when I've been farther away from Christ. There have been times when I've been double-minded. I was willing to compromise what I know is the truth. There have been times when you could beat me upside the head with a bat, and I would change from being close to what I know God has got for me to do. There are times when we closer and times when we're not so close. As we get older, as we grow in our faith, as we become sanctified, more purely reflecting Jesus Christ in our life, uh, is less double-minded. That's what I would add to what you say. Mike, what's your take? you got the last word, and then we're going to pray. Well, I think we said it all in the way, and uh, for me, the, for me, the takeaway is the book of Acts is all about the power of the Spirit of God being witnesses to the resurrection. So that in mind. Amen. I'm going to leave you all with this, and then we're going to pray. They were successful. Sergio Paulus believed because of what he saw uh, Paul do with this false prophet. He had a living faith that was uh, affected by his uh, experience with the Holy Spirit there. So that's the wonder of the book of Acts. We see God working time after time after time in this one. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day and the blessings of it. Lord, hear your people. You've heard their request this morning. Please, Lord, please have mercy on them. Don't let them go. Minister to them in the ways that they need. Your will be done, Lord, in their lives. Protect them as they go. Protect their families, their children, their grandchildren. Keep them safe, Lord. Bring them back. Watch over them. That's our prayer. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ.